All right, thank you so much, everybody. Um, I look forward to discussing the impossible stoma tips and tricks. So, make sure I get this, I have no disclosures. So I think all of us have been in the situation where we've encountered an impossible stoma, where we're sweating in the operating room, trying to figure out how we're gonna make a functional stoma for a patient, and trying to avoid something that looks like this down the road, either a stoma in a, wound, uh, in a incision or a scar where basically it's impossible to pouch. Uh, on the right side there, a stoma that never was really able to come up to the abdominal wall without tension, so therefore separated from the mucocutaneous junction, got ischemic and is now retracted, this is terrible. And then finally, even stomas where you may have a lot of length, but you've devascularized it so much that it becomes ischemic and dies. So, you know, I had to ask myself when I was preparing this talk, why are stomas actually difficult in these patients? And the, I came up with this list of risk factors, so to speak, and sometimes a thick abdominal wall in combination with a thick and foreshortened mesentery can make it very difficult to bring up a stoma that's appropriate. Um, somebody who has a bowel obstruction, you're dealing with very dilated bowel that's very difficult to mobilize and maybe very, very dilated to the point where it's very hard to get it through a small stoma opening, putting them at risk for a peristomal hernia down the future. Um, somebody who's had prior inc incisions and multiple scars in their abdomen that you're trying to avoid and place a stoma in the right location for them. Somebody who may have had mesh from a previous hernia repair, for example, um, that you're trying to get around or get through. And finally, um, patients who are basically critically ill in the operating room, you're trying to hurry along and get through the operation. And those are patients that most often need the stoma. So um, this is my list of things that we're gonna talk about a little bit today. So I think the first question um, that I ask myself in the operating room is, does this patient really need a stoma? And I'm weighing those risk factors of not giving them a stoma versus giving them a stoma and sort of thinking down the line about whether they can ever have the stoma reversed. Um, certainly, I also try to think if there's a way to give them a temporary stoma because even a temporary bad stoma is better than a permanent bad stoma. Sometimes a primary anastomosis and then moving upstream for a temporary stoma is, is possible in some cases. Um, if you have the luxury of it preoperatively, stoma uh, marking is, of course, the best way to try to optimize stoma placement, stoma function down the road. It's well known that preoperative stoma marking is actually um, helpful in decreasing complications and length of stay. And then there's this old adage that it's better to create an ugly stoma in a good location than a pretty stoma in an ugly location. And so if it's possible, of course, wound ostomy nurses are wonderful. We try usually to put an ostomy in the quote unquote ostomy triangle, and that is outlined by the umbilicus, the anterior superior iliac spine, and the pubic symphysis, um, you know, away from folds, scars, away from the midline. But actually, this ostomy triangle doesn't really work for many of our patients, um, especially considering somebody who may be bed bound or somebody who may be morbidly obese who can't actually even see the ostomy triangle. Um, certainly, ostomies have to be placed where we think it would be the best functional situation for that particular patient. So coming back again to preoperative stoma marking, this is a patient who obviously is obese, also has had multiple operations, has lots of scars, has a large panis. And you can see that this patient was marked both in the standing and the sitting position, and both markings are in the upper abdomen. Um, the abdominal wall is thinner in that, above the umbilicus, and so um, this is helpful for getting the stoma up through the abdominal wall, and also because the patient can actually see where the stoma is located. Um, this is a patient who had, who looks perfect. They're reclining on the left side there, so of course in the operating room it looks like it's a perfect stoma, but as soon as they stand up, you can see that actually all their skin folds cover up the stoma. So this would have been something that would have probably been caught in a preoperative stoma marking. Sometimes you don't have the luxury of meeting the patient ahead of time. This is, you walk in the operating room and you have a patient that looks like this and you're trying to figure out where you're gonna end up putting that stoma. Again, super umbilical placement is the best if possible because the wall is thinner and also able to be visualized by the patient. And then another trick might be to just go to the CT scan and actually measure the thickness of the abdominal wall to get some idea of what you're gonna be dealing with down the road. Sometimes if you're in the operating room and you, uh, the, you, know, you haven't met a patient when they're still awake, you can actually put the, the table in reverse Trondellenburg, steep reverse Trondellenburg, to see if you can see where the panis is going to fold. So intraoperatively, when you're trying to make that stoma and you're, getting, you're having difficulty, I think the number one thing is to make sure that we use healthy tissue. We're all kind of tempted to leave a little bit of maybe some inflamed tissue from diverticular disease or, or something to just give us a little extra length, um, but that only causes more problems down the road. So the main important thing is to use healthy tissue. 
Um, secondly, to mobilize as much as possible. I don't think I've ever been in the situation where I thought I mobilized too much after trying to make the ostomy. I always end up in the opposite situation where I get frustrated that I didn't mobilize, take down the splenic flexure, for example, or even sometimes ligate the inferior mesenteric artery and vein if needed to get extra length. Um, you can also, of course, score the peritoneum just like you would for a J pouch um, to get extra length on your stoma. Sometimes you have to actually enlarge the abdominal wall defect to allow passage of a thick piece of colon and colon mesentery, and then close that uh, defect a little bit around what you've passed through that ostomy uh, aperture. Another option would be to actually create um, a stoma extraction in two stages. So you lift the subcutaneous tissue and skin off of the rectus, anterior rectus sheath, and you pass your stoma through the rectus and the rectus sheath, and then secondarily you pass it up through uh, the subcutaneous tissue and skin. Another helpful thing for a really thick abdominal wall would be to use a wound protector. In this um, picture here, there's an Alexis wound protector. Um, just pointing at this third uh, picture here. This is the external view, and of course, this is the internal view. Um, and you're able to pull up a piece of um, very thick colon and colon mesentery through a, a defect that you can try to minimize in size to minimize the effect of peristomal hernia in the, in the future. The one key thing about this is just to make sure that you cut the internal ring um, when you're uh, done moving the colon through that uh, wound protector in order to be able to remove the uh, wound protector without injuring the bowel as you're extracting the, the wound protector. Um, stoma rods, of course, everybody knows about these, um, to try to help a loop ostomy stay above skin level. So you, basically anything can become a stoma rod. This is a, on the left here is just a picture of maybe a Foley catheter that's folded on itself and tied or a Penrose drain. Um, here in the middle is a red rubber catheter and of course there's the commercially available stoma rods as well. Um, another option would be to try to change the shape of the stoma. For example, on the left there, if you're trying to make a loop, you need a loop colostomy, for example, and the colon and the colon mesentery is extremely thick, maybe the abdominal wall is really thick, um, dividing the bowel actually so you get an end stoma and as also a mucous fistula where you only remove maybe the corner of the distal staple line allows you to make a more manageable stoma and sometimes be able to bring it up through a really thick wall. And finally, on that right side is basically, if you can't get anything to come up the abdominal wall, uh, this is just a description of, uh, or a picture of, um, just bringing up the anti-mesenteric border as much as you can and just basically tacking it to the skin. So, um, lastly, in terms of intraoperative techniques, um, of course, if you have a very dilated colon, or co small bowel for that matter, um, decompressing it if you can prior to passing it through the ostomy um, site would be ideal. If you can do that without contamination, uh, it allows you to determine if the bowel is actually still viable. It allows you to uh, make a smaller stoma uh, aperture, and it gives you greater mobility by far. So um, what if a colostomy is just not possible? Then the next thing we move on to is maybe an ileostomy, if that's feasible for that patient. Ileostomies can be very difficult to make too. So some of the same um, principles apply here, using a super umbilical placement in obese individuals, um, mobilizing the mesentery as much as possible, even to the base of the duodenum, ligating the ileocolic artery if necessary, scoring the peritoneum, and then just creating a uh, ostomy that's flush to the skin if you can't get it to uh, evert or brook. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about are three techniques for creating an ileostomy that you may not have thought about um, that might be helpful, again, in these very complicated patients. So the first is this thing called a Roux-en-Y ileostomy. Uh, this is described in a paper from uh, France, from Nice. And actually, um, in the paper, they use it on four patients. And I searched the literature to see if anybody else has ever used a Roux-en-Y ileostomy, and it has not been published. So I will describe their technique here, and it's actually really interesting. So what they do is they do a subcutaneous um, lipectomy, so you see that little area of the subcutaneous uh, fat that they remove to make the ostomy a little bit closer to the skin or decrease the, the thickness of the abdominal wall. Uh, they divide the terminal ileum or distal ileum about 40 centimeters proximal to the ileocecal valve, make their rule limb here leading up to the skin about 20 centimeters here, and then they staple a TA stapler across this distal portion so that, of course, the bowel contents come out through the ileostomy. Um, in their four patients, actually this worked very well. Uh, when they were ready to take down the ileostomy, they stuck a endoscope through here, a, a, a flexible sigmoidoscope, and they were able to notice that about well, every single one of the patients actually had partial disruption of the staple line already, so there was also already some reopening of this. Um, they were able to just disrupt the rest of the staples with the endoscope and then free this up from the uh, abdominal wall and staple it off, so no bowel anastomosis even uh, in their closure, which is a beauty in somebody who's very, very big. Uh, so this is a really interesting te technique. I think I'm going to try it next time. Time. 
Uh, the second of these techniques um, that you might be um, unfamiliar with so far is a percutaneous ileostomy. So this has been described in the literature a few times. Um, but what it is basically is um, using a jejunostomy tube placed in the distal ileum and inflating the balloon to occlude the bowel lumen. And then, of course, you have to make sure that this portion of the, of the tube that uh, has these uh, fenestrations are in the proximal limb. So all of the succus basically can come out through, the ileos uh, through this jejunostomy, uh, percutaneous ileostomy. Um, and basically, in this case, they kept patients on a liquid diet while they had this in place. Uh, this is a study of 143 patients um, from this group uh, between 2006 and 2012, and what they did was they used this in the cases where the patients had a low anterior resection with total mesorectal excision for rectal cancer, so patients that would normally get an ileostomy. It's not a randomized study, but they did have 75 patients that they used the percutaneous ileostomy for and 68 that they had a conventional loop ileostomy. Um, what they did for the percutaneous ileostomies was a barium enema on post-op day eight or nine uh, to make sure that the anastomosis had healed well before they removed it. Their 30-day post-operative complications are interesting. The percutaneous ileostomy, there was one anastomotic leak where they had to convert to a regular ileostomy and three wound infections where the, ileostomy, the percutaneous ileostomy um, tube had been placed. But in the conventional ileostomy, actually there were multiple um, post-operative complications, leaks, bowel obstruction, stoma stenosis, wound infections, and then peristomal hernias. When they looked at uh, their post closure complications, so in other words, patients who had their ileostomy closed or their percutaneous ileostomy removed, uh, again, they found further um, more complications than those that had their conventional ileostomy reversed. And actually, I should mention that only 80% of the conventional ileostomies actually ever had them reversed um, down the line. So this doesn't mean that uh, percutaneous ileostomy is actually a good thing, um, but I think it's something to keep in your back pocket if you really can't get a stoma up to the abdominal wall. And then finally, um, this is a virtual ileostomy. That's a, the third technique that I wanted to talk about today. So this is a paper from Spain. And what they did was, um, again, in patients who had a low colorectal anastomosis who would normally get an ileostomy, they tried this technique of virtual ileostomy. And what that meant was uh, that they put a... Um, uh, vessel loop around the distal ileum, about 20 or 30 centimeters proximal to the ileocecal valve, and they exteriorized that vessel loop through where they had a five millimeter port, trocar, um, at the ileostomy site. So, uh, and then they sutured this vessel loop to the skin, and they left it there. And for those patients that eventually needed conversion of a virtual ileostomy to real ileostomy, it was very simple. Um, they were able to just basically open the skin, uh, bring up the loop of bowel, uh, and mature a loop ileostomy. And actually, they described doing this under local anesthesia. Um, but in this paper, it's a retrospective study. They had 44 patients undergoing this uh, the virtual ileostomy. Uh, they did a flexible sigmoidoscopy on everybody on post-step day three. They had eight of them that had to convert to a real ileostomy, all of whom actually had their stoma closed down the road. And the vessel loop, of course, would be removed if they were discharged without a problem. So certainly, again, this is not a, a technique to use in a patient that absolutely needs some kind of stoma. But if they're on the fence and you're thinking that you may be able to get away without one, this may be an option uh, for managing that difficult patient. And my very last slide is just a patient that um, we had recently who actually has a beautiful stoma. You can see here right on the left side, uh, on, the right, on the patient's right side, uh, with the stoma bag there. But unfortunately, their abdom abdominal wall dehisced, and uh, they ended up with these enterocutaneous fistulas, enteroatmospheric fistulas, actually. And I just want to describe what we did in order to manage this patient, because this I would consider a difficult ostomy. So um, we actually made, uh, we used the wound vac system, we made a donut out of the gray sponge and uh, coated that gray sponge in the um, sort of uh, tegaderm looking uh, plastic. And we placed that donut right over the area to isolate the two fistulas there. We then placed vac sponge, white vac sponge, over the rest of the abdomen and used that as a conventional vac system. We put a stoma bag on top of the fistulas. The one trick I would say is that um, we actually put the stoma bag, which had a malincott tube in it uh, with fenestrations, on a little bit higher suction than we put the actual vac over the rest of the abdomen in order to sort of preferentially draw out any of the succus into the ostomy bag and keep it from being on the rest of the abdomen. And of course, this is actually not the same patient because we haven't gotten to that far, but um, our goal would be to get to this point where we basically have skin grafting over the rest of the abdomen and then an ostomy that is a little bit better managed uh, in the wound itself.
So in summary, um, for that impossible stoma, I think there are just a few key things. Um, Preoperative stoma marking is key. Mobilizing as much as bowel as po- mobilizing as much as, bo- as much bowel as possible, or even more than you think necessary, uh, is always helpful. Uh, trying to place a temporary stoma instead of a permanent stoma. Uh, considering an ileostomy instead of a colostomy, if a colostomy is not possible, and then finally considering one of these three techniques that are new out there. Well, thank you very much.